Let's pray again. Lord, I thank you once again for this morning, Lord, that, that you indeed hear us, Lord. You've heard our prayers that we already prayed to you. And God, I know that as your children, you want to speak to us. Lord, that you love us. God, that, that your Holy Spirit was sent to dwell inside of us, that your Holy Spirit is among us. And Lord, I pray for the gift of teaching by your Spirit, the gift of prophecy and exhortation, Lord. And Lord, that your word would cut, divide, pierce, convict, edify. Lord, that I truly handle your word by your Spirit today, Father. And Lord, again, we pray for our brothers and sisters that join us online. God, that you'd minister to them as well. Lord, we pray that you'd raise up pastors in the various states and in this state, Lord, where, where your sheep are there. Lord, where the sheep are weary and scattered as sheep without a shepherd, Lord, we know that you are the true chief shepherd, Father, but we pray for under shepherds. Lord, shepherds that are under you, that will love you, Lord. And just as, as you asked Peter, do you love me? And he said, yes. And you told him to feed your sheep, to tend your flock. And so, Lord, I pray for those people that will love you first and foremost, Lord, and because of their love for you, they will tend to your sheep, Lord. And God, I pray for those pastors that will kick the wolves out, Lord, and not try to keep them happy. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're going to continue our study in the book of Leviticus this morning, chapter 20. We've been going through the Old Testament law. Now, this law, it tells us in Galatians, is our schoolmaster to bring us to Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.24, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So this right here should bring conviction upon our souls that we need a Savior. It is our tutor, it's our schoolmaster to say, God, I need somebody to save me. I have sinned, I've fallen short. With that said, many of these laws in here, many, not all, many, are commands for New Testament believers. Now, I say that not in the sense that we are saved by obedience to them, but if you are indeed saved, you will follow some of these commands. And we've been going over this. Don't get me wrong. The Sabbath, certain foods, those were for the Israelites. But there are certain commands, such as honoring your mother and your father, murdering, offering up a child to Molech. Those are all still very sinful and commands not to do or to do in the New Testament. Now, our justification comes from Christ. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. You are to leave here today justified by faith in Jesus Christ, but my prayer is, is that this law right here, if it does its job, if your heart's open, you're going to be convicted of sin. You will be convicted, and you will say, I need you, Jesus. I need somebody to pay for my sin because I can't do it. This law is not here to make you feel good. This law is here to proclaim God's righteousness and to show that you fall short of God's law and his glory. Further in Galatians, it says, even if we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So praise God for Jesus Christ. Praise God for a way to him through blood. Remember, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so as we've been reading this law, there's always a sacrifice that can be made. Although in some cases, the person had to die, and we'll read about that today, the death penalty. But there was a sacrifice for sin. Something had to die in your place for breaking the law. We know that ultimately Jesus Christ came and died. So Leviticus chapter 20. We're going to be dealing with the penalties of breaking God's law. Last week, we went over moral and ceremonial laws, and now we're going to be going over the penalty for breaking those. Verse 1, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Again you shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever of the children of Israel, or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Very clear. Molech, covered again last week. Molech was a statue, it was a false god, it was an idol that had outstretched arms or a hole cut in the womb of it or where the abdomen was. And what they'd do is they'd heat it up with fire and they would take their baby and put it on the arms while they beat drums so they couldn't hear it dying or they'd put it in the abdomen area that was cut out to kill the baby. In context of it though, in chapter 18, it was dealing with sexual immorality. 
So we can conclude that people would have intercourse, but they wouldn't want the baby that came from it. So what would they do? They would offer it up. They would look spiritual. They would offer up their infant to Molech, therefore killing the child. And God is very clear. He says, again, you shall say to the children of Israel, whoever of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, that is that false God, he shall surely be put to death. That is, that person shall die. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. That is a form of execution. So this applies to modern-day abortion. There's no question. Modern-day abortion is similar to the worship of Molech in that somebody wants to go out and have an intimate relationship with somebody but not have the child. They, they want to have the pleasure, but they, they, you know what? The child's going to cause them some type of pain or inconvenience, so what do they do? They go abort the baby. And in our country, it's legal. But according to God's law, it's illegal. It's worthy of death. So in our land, you can offer up your child to modern-day Molech and not be put in jail. But on Judgment Day, God's law will stand. There is a Judgment Day for that. Back when we were in Exodus chapter 21. See, this deals with the child that comes out of them. This is extra late-term abortion. This is the baby actually came out, and you put this human that was breathing outside of the womb to death. Now, the Bible also covers somebody inside the womb. God still considers the person inside of the womb a human being. Listen to this. Exodus 21, verse 22. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely. So if two men are fighting, somehow the woman gets involved in the middle. And so God says, okay, if two men are fighting, the woman somehow gets in the middle and she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. So the husband of the pregnant woman gets to pick, okay, my child came out. The child was all right. There was no harm done to the child. So the person is still in trouble that hurt the woman that made her give birth to this child early. However, listen to this. But if any harm follows, any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Very clear. That's how it works. See, if the baby actually died, say it came out and then the woman gave birth to a dead child, God considered that person in the womb a living being. So therefore it is life for life. Now, if there's some type of defect, it's, you could say defect for defect. God considers the person in the womb a human being. Even if our culture says that's not a human, that doesn't count, God says it counts. And by putting a young person to death, you too are worthy of death in God's eyes. Verse 3, I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Molech. God is going to set his face against that person for doing that among the Israelites and this could be by stoning, to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. So here's what happens. You have these Israelites here to be God's chosen people. They're separate. They're different. They're holy. They're not unclean. They're supposed to be clean. But if somebody among them offers up their child to Moloch, that person is to be stoned. And God is giving further reason of their wickedness. It says, because they defile a sanctuary and profane his holy name. These would be the same people that are supposed to worship God, but they'd be offering up their baby to Molech and saying, okay, now I'm going to go bring my offering to God's temple or his sanctuary. Or I'm going to call upon the name of the Lord. Yes, I believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but here, offer up the child to Molech. That is serious sin. Now, that's not much different than modern day false Christianity. Now, there are true Christians. There's certainly a remnant church scattered abroad the world of real believers. But there's also fake Christianity. Christianity that says, hey, it's okay to do whatever you want to do. Just say you're a Christian and you're saved. And I'm sure, I, I mean, I can't say for a fact, but it's highly likely that there are people in many of the modern seeker-sensitive churches that have had abortion without conviction. Now, I'm not saying it is the unforgivable sin. That person, as wicked as the sin is, can be forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is forgivable. And praise God for that amount of forgiveness that is available to them. I would pray for them to get saved even if they did that. God still wants them saved. That is God's mercy and grace. However, there are people who will do this with an unrepentant heart. 
they will say, oh, I love Jesus, praise the Lord, and probably go out and have an abortion. That is serious sin. It's nothing new. It was actually going on with the Israelites. Listen to Ezekiel 23, 37. It says, for they have committed adultery, and blood is on their hands. They have committed adultery with their idols, and even sacrificed their sons, whom they bore to me, passing them through the fire to devour them. That means passing through the fire, giving them to Molech. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day and profaned my Sabbaths. For after they had slain their children for their idols, on the same day they came into my sanctuary to profane it, and indeed, thus they have done it in the midst of my house. There is no conviction of sin. Even though the Jews had it so clear, they had God's law, that this was wrong. So simple. Don't offer up your child to Molech. But you know what? They were going to have their own made-up, man-made religion. And it goes to show that if they could actually show up to God's temple and sanctuary after doing that, the, the whole congregation must have been all right with it. Maybe a remnant still said it was wrong, but the overall consensus of the people was, this is okay. You can do that. Just because the group says it's okay does not mean God says it's okay. Jeremiah 7, verse 9. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? That was their heart. That, hey, we can do all these abominations. It is okay. God's law is so clear. You can't do this. You can't worship God and idols. You can't offer up your child to Molech and have God be okay with it. You can't defile God's sanctuary and have him say it's all right. Defiling God's sanctuary is wickedness. And the same goes for the New Testament church. We as believers, and I've been hitting this up a lot, but we are God's temple by the Holy Spirit in us. And what an honor that is to be that we don't have to go to the temple in Jerusalem right now, but that God is right in us and we can go to the heavenly sanctuary through Jesus Christ. That is a great honor. However, if you defile God's temple, the Bible's clear, he's going to destroy you. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone, anyone means anyone, that applies to everybody, defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. We are to be a holy church, a holy temple with the Holy Spirit in us. And what a great gift. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or you, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And listen to this. And you are not your own. We, we have to really understand that, that we're not our own. That this isn't my best life now. Joel Osteen has it all wrong in so many ways. It's not, first of all, if you're a Christian, it's your best life later, but it's not even your life to begin with. It is the life that God purchased through his son. See, it says here, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Th this is God's temple. If you are born again, God's spirit is in you. You are never alone. That's the amazing thing. You know, as a born again Christian, you could be dropped off on an island by yourself and you're not alone. I mean, God is there. His spirit is in you. You always have that relationship with him. And that is amazing. I mean, people in this world get bored and they say, I have nothing to do. Well, li listen, God's in you if you're saved. I, I can always talk to God. I mean, what, what a great thing. What a great relationship or fellowship to have with God through Jesus Christ. We need to be aware of that, though, that we cannot defile God's sanctuary or God's temple. The Jews are being warned about defiling his sanctuary and profaning his holy name, which can still be done in the new covenant. Verse 4 and if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man when he gives some of his descendants to Molech and they do not kill him. So now God is warning those. Because whose job was it to call him out? The other people. And you'd have to bring them to the judges. Hey, look, I saw Joe Blow over here giving up his child to Molech. And it's not out of a heart that you're hoping the guy dies, but the wickedness needs to be put away. So what do you do? You, you have the man put to death. However, Human tendency, and this is human tendency, not all but many of us will wrestle with this during our life, is to maintain human relationship over relationship with God. Because see, saying that, hey, this guy is out worshiping Molech, he needs to be put to death, is going to make you lose a lot of friends, because that guy's got friends, there's a lot of apostasy and corruption that's going to go on among the Israelites, and by doing that, you're stepping out, but you're stepping out with God and saying, God, I'm going to honor you 
over everybody and everything else. And they are to do this. But if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man, just say, you know, I'm going to turn a blind eye to that sin. We're not to turn blind eye to sin. We're not to play the game and say, oh, I didn't see that sin or that sin's not that bad. Oh, I'm not going to be judgmental. Listen, if you're a Christian, you got to judge. We don't judge the world, but you judge those who claim to know God. You bring judgment. And don't let the devil convince you otherwise. I can show you scriptures that say you are to judge. And you're to judge with a loving heart. You're not to judge hypocritically, but you are to judge those inside the church. If you see somebody in sin, you bring judgment. And the judgment is to hopefully to get them to repent. But if they don't repent, we know that church discipline says you got to go. You're not part of the body of Christ. And that is in hopes, it says in 1 Corinthians, that their soul may be saved. You're not doing anybody any good by not judging them and letting them go to hell right in the midst of the fellowship of God's people. And a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. You need a little leaven, it ruins it all. We got to get rid of leaven. But the tendency is to turn a blind eye. And so God's warning them. If the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man when he gives some of his descendants to Molech and they do not kill him. Listen, they're not willing to kill the guy. They're not willing to say this guy is so wicked he needs to be put away from us. Then I, God is speaking, will set my face against the man and against his family and will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. Now, there's two different takes on the interpretation of verse 5. Some people believe that it's primarily dealing with the guy that offered to Molech, and I, I personally interpret this, and I pray that I'm right, but I will tell you there's other takes on that he's dealing with the people who turn a blind eye to sin, who's who he's dealing with right here. And that would be in the context, I believe, the best interpretation, where it says, then I will set my face against that man, against his family, talking about those who turned a blind eye to sin, and will cut him off, from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. See, by choosing somebody that is in wicked sin that we know is in wicked sin over God is to commit harlotry. You're committing harlotry with that person. You have the harlot church system of Revelation 17. It's, it's Babylonianism with Christianity, and it is tempting, and that temptation will be out there to play the harlot with God. But God always needs to be our first love. Yeah, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That says in the seconds like it, your neighbor as yourself. But neighbor comes second. Brother and sister, second. Wife, husband, second. Number one love in every believer's life is to be God. That's it. God first. Everything else, second. But God first. And as often pushed on us today, well, you got to just love your neighbor. Yeah, I'm going to love my neighbor but I'm going to love God first. And I pray that that goes for you too, that you choose God first in everything. And that's hard sometimes, especially with a prodigal child that, that I have one. You, but you know what? I choose God. I, I love God. I'm upholding the commandments in my house. And we need to always choose God. God is the only one that will truly satisfy your soul. In the midst of every trial, in the midst of when you do stand up and judge, in the midst when you take a stand and you lose human relationship, God's there. And it's at those times where you're really low in this world, that you're on your knees, that you're generally closest to God and God is filling you with his joy. There is something about going through a trial, going through something that just, that twists you on the inside. But you fall down on your knees and say, God, I need you right now. You know that he's there. His spirit is there. His spirit will comfort you. The Holy Spirit is our comfort. That's something the world doesn't have, but we as believers have that you can have that genuine comfort of the Holy Spirit in the midst of some of the worst times you will ever have. And I'm not saying it's not painful, but the Holy Spirit is there and he will comfort you and he will bring you peace and he'll bring you joy in the midst of your tears because God is that good. But here's the deal. They are to call out sin there. We are not to hide our eyes from it. Verse 6. And the person who turns the mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. So the person that turned to mediums, familiar spirits, that, those that communicate with the dead. And that, that's somewhat popular today. You hear people say, well, I'm spiritual. Yeah, there is a lot of spiritual stuff going on. That doesn't mean that you're Christian. And just because somebody had a spiritual experience does not mean they came in contact with God. There are all types of spirits. There's the Holy Spirit. You have angels. You have demons. And people genuinely have spiritual experiences, but they're oftentimes demonic. If you've noticed, I don't like to use the word experience. We do have experiences, but experience doesn't mean it's true or it's right. 
the word of God tells us what's true and what's right. Somebody could go try to contact their dead relative and, and genuinely have an experience. I will tell you that they came in contact with demons, but they can be convinced that, no, I, I talked to my dead child and I read you quotes last week from that book, Have Heart by the Burgers, Sarah and Eric Berger, which was endorsed by Greg Laurie. It's endorsed by Chuck Messler, big name guys. And they're communicating to their dead child. That, that's not their child. I will tell you that right now. That is a demonic spirit. These people that contact demonic spirits or seek somebody with a familiar spirit, God says, cut them off. They're going to be cut off. Death penalty. As we read God's law, it's death penalty. If you steal, it's payback. It, there's not a whole lot of room. If you're wicked, you get killed. You get put away. They, they don't have jails here. Now, I want to bring up one other person that is into talking to the dead. That is, her stuff is often promoted as great. People like it. She is not great. Her stuff is not good. It is Roma Downey. She recently had the Son of God movie, which I went to see and I did a review on. It is not good. She had the Bible miniseries. You have all these people talking about, oh, you got to watch this. No, you don't have to watch it. You have to read the Word of God. First of all, before I even get into who she is, it's about the Word. God gave us his word. Words are black and white. Every word in here has a definition. If we want to know about God, it's through his word. Now, when you get into movies, it's very much, oh, it can make you feel a certain way. Or maybe Jesus, he kind of made me feel this way. It's subjective. It's not black and white. Movies are very subjective. They are not black and white like the word of God. Words have meanings. You could see a play and say, well, that made me feel a certain way. And beyond that, much of how they have Jesus act, we don't know what his disposition was when he said something. We don't know how he said it. We don't know what he was wearing. It just, that's not the way, we don't have those details and people are making up details. And one other point with movies and TVs, programs that portray Jesus, Jesus is God who put on humanity, okay? No sinful human being can portray God in the flesh. No sinner can do that. You cannot portray God in the flesh. Only Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. God put on humanity to come save us. So with, that, with all that said, we're talking about mediums, people who seek the dead. Roma Downey, and this is years ago, but I believe she's still the same, in 2002, appeared on the John Edward show. You guys know who John Edward was? He used to have the show Crossing Over where you talk to dead people. Well, Roma Downey uh, actually spoke to her dead mother. Now, we know that she didn't speak to her mother, but she probably spoke to some demonic spirits through John Edward. These people are to be put to death. They're not to be put up on a pedestal and said, hey, I want this lady to teach me about Jesus. Not at all. Then, and you can look this one up on Amazon. She, her, the book is for sale on there. It's by John Edward, the, the psychic medium guy called Practical Praying, Using the Rosary to Enhance Your Life. That's great. He's into the rosary. I, I can understand why. Now, with that, it includes a special little gift. It includes a meditation CD featuring actress Roma Downey. She's right in with John Edwards, right in with this medium guy. We are to put these people to death. That, that, that is wickedness. Now, obviously, in the United States, we don't put them to death, but understand on the day of judgment, God will put them to eternal torment, eternal death forever. Verse 7, consecrate yourselves and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. They are told to consecrate themselves, to, to sanctify themselves, to set themselves apart and to be holy because he says, for I am the Lord your God. And then in verse 8, it says, and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. I love that. See, God is the one that sanctifies them. He's the one that sets them apart. And it goes this way in the new covenant too. God is the one that cleanses you, but you're also told to cleanse yourself. Now in the day of judgment, our sins are wiped away purely by the blood of Jesus. However, in this walk here on earth, there are verses that exhort us to be holy, to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. It says, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And it is both ways. You have people who will go to one extreme or the other and say, well, God does it all. Anything I do, that's just a work. Yo, we are told to do works. Faith without works is dead. Our works don't save us, but our works always follow faith. And right here, God sanctifies us, but also sanctify yourself. It is God's work and it is our work too. And I want to make it clear, and I do, on the day of judgment, it is ultimately the blood of Jesus that wipes you clean, that and that alone. Verse nine, for everyone who curses his father or his mother, shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother, 
his blood shall be upon him. Old Testament law, the Apostle Paul quotes it in the New Testament as well. This is one of those things where when people say, don't bring me under the law, you're illegal. Well, hold on now. God still says for New Testament believers, this is very applicable. This started back in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, 12. It says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. <clears throat> then in Leviticus 19 last week, it was reiterated, every one of you shall revere his mother and his father and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. So it's something that needs to be done. Now, here it gives a death penalty. That is how serious it is to curse a father or a mother, not to honor a father or mother. And does that mean that the parents automatically say, well, my kid was disrespectful. I'm going to go have and put to death. No, not at all. You have to understand the spirit behind this. The spirit behind is that the Bible tells us to correct a child, to raise them up in a way that's right. They are born sinners. Proverbs 22, 15 says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. So there are ways to discipline a child, to raise him in a way that's right. And that is the parent's heart. That is God's heart is that God raises us up. We're not perfectly obedient at the beginning. You look at Abraham. Abraham was a man who had many flaws, but at the end, he's willing to give up his very own son. He believed God. And it's our same deal with our children is that we raise them up. And by the end, we pray they're doing what's right. It's our job to give them that rod of correction because it can drive the foolishness from them. The Jews in the wilderness, God gave them 40 years, but he said, no, you can't go in. They ultimately did not enter his rest, which means they weren't saved. But the second generation went in. See, God is patient, but the time comes where God says, that's it. No more. Now, with our children, it is our job as parents to uphold the Ten Commandments and to uphold this commandment in our house. Obviously, not the Sabbath. Jesus fulfilled that rest. But it's our job as parents to uphold the commandments of God, to teach our children that there is punishment and that there is discipline for breaking. And that if they finish their life dishonoring me or dishonoring my wife, that death ultimately will occur. That that is worthy of the death penalty in God's eyes. That, that is how severe that is. Even though we live in a day and age where it says that there will be perilous times that children will be disobedient to parents. Yeah, we live in that day. And just because our culture says it's okay for a child to dishonor their parents does not mean that God accepts it. God doesn't accept abortion. He does not accept disobedience to a mother and a father. It is our job as parents to teach that, to uphold God's plan, to uphold his commandments. And how do you do that? It's easy. The rod of correction is very simple. You don't need to read a whole bunch of other books. Go to this book. Go to the book of Proverbs and read about parenting. Go to the book of Ephesians. You can read about it. It's simple. It's just a matter of obedience. And we're to discipline them promptly. By not upholding God's commands, you understand that we're letting our children go into a place where they are deserving of death. That's not a place that we want them to go. And I even know as, as, as a father, my children are sinful, but it is my job as a parent to say, you can't do that. And even when you're erasing no mom and no dad from their vocabulary, and then they show it with their body language. And you say, nope, stand up straight when I tell you no. You're not going to say no with your body language either. There is nothing you're going to honor and respect me underneath my roof. The door is there. I don't want you to leave, but you can go out it underneath my roof. You need to honor me. And that goes for each one of us. Just because the culture says it's normal for a child to hit their mother or father or to talk back to their mother and father does not mean that God has ever accepted that. Now, with the death penalty, again, the unbeliever, the atheist likes to take this part of Scripture or Deuteronomy and say, well, it says put children to death. Yes, it does. It is worthy of death there. Again, I need to reiterate, it wasn't something that just happened overnight that the kid was instantly bad and he had to put to death. No, that is not a parent's heart. But it was after continual rebellion and continually trying to correct that the point came, and I believe it was a very sad day for any parent that had to do that. Listen, Deuteronomy 21. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them. See, see these parents have tried and tried and tried. They tried chasing him. There's not modern-day parenting where they say, oh, they're just being kids. That's not proper. Then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of the city. And they shall say to the elders of the city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious and he will not, heed our, he will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones 
So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Had to be done sometimes. Sad, terrible, gut-wrenching thing, but the evil had to be put away. So did this happen all the time? Highly unlikely. Probably in the rare case where the person was just that bad that it was there. And we can teach our children that this points them towards Jesus as much as we want to say today that children are so good and they're born great, they're born sinners. They are sinful, they are selfish, and yes, we love them just as God loves us. We love them, but we need to teach them that they've broken God's law and that they need a Savior. This law right here, you can bring this up to your child and say, look, you know what? You're deserving of death. And there's one way out of this on the day of judgment. It is Jesus Christ. This law should not make you feel good. It should not make your children feel good. It should point them towards Jesus in the need of a savior and make them be so grateful that they have a way to heaven. Verse 10, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Death penalty, adultery. Again, it's okay in America. In Israel, it was not okay. Death penalty. And on the day of judgment, it is worthy of the death penalty apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. These sins, I want to say this again, they're not unforgivable sins. They are sins that can be washed away by the blood of Jesus. However, it is deserving of death. As many as people want to say, I can look, it's okay. Listen, look in sinful, it's lusting, it's coveting your neighbor's wife, and then it leads to adultery. None of that's okay, especially for men of God. When we are out in the public place, and I work with the, in a barber shop, so there's men there all the time and say, oh, did you see her? No, I'm trying not to look. I'm not looking over there. I have a wife. When they say, well, what's wrong with looking? Well, that's sinful. That's lusting. That's coveting. And it leads to adultery. You want nothing to do with the men of God. We need to stand up and say, no, I'm not looking. You can look, but I'm not doing it. Tell them it's sinful. Man of David, a man of God fell into sin with Bathsheba with that. What does it start? It starts with a look, adultery. So it's deserving of death. But I want to read to you something that we're all familiar with. John chapter 8, dealing with a woman caught in adultery, and Jesus is indeed merciful and gracious. Yes, the law is there. She's deserving of death, but there is the mercy and the grace of God. And he doesn't accept sin. He doesn't say, hey, that's cool. It's not that bad. No, he does tell her to go and sin no more. But let me read this to you. John 8, verse 2. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him and sat down, and he taught them. And then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? And they're, they're quoting the law. Hey, the, these people to be stoned. What do you have to say? This they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. So these people had no interest in God's law really being upheld. They were trying to accuse Jesus of something. This woman just happened to get in the crosshairs. And there are wicked people like that who really have no regard for someone else's life. They just want to take someone else down. I mean, Jesus knows why they're asking this. They are wicked people. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. I love that. And so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he was without sin among you. Let him throw a stone at her first. So he gives, hey, whoever here doesn't have sin. It's not saying don't judge. The Bible does tell us to do this. But he knows that these guys have some wicked sins, so wicked they're trying to catch the Son of God in some type of sin so they can accuse him. These are extremely wicked, sinful men that on the outside might look clean, whitewashed sepulchers. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted of their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's amazing. That is mercy. That is grace. She deserved death. This woman, I mean, just put yourself in her shoes for a second as much as we can. She was brought to this rabbi by these other religious guys, caught in sin, worthy of the death penalty. She knew in her heart that she deserved death. There was no question. She, she was facing execution. And God, knowing her heart, shows her mercy and grace. And when we preach the gospel to people, somebody's in adultery, you might tell them, look, you're facing execution on the day of judgment. And if they truly have a repent of heart and say, whoa, whoa, I, I need to repent, this is bad, you know what? Let me tell you about Jesus. 
Let me tell you about the forgiveness of sins. Let me tell you about the one whom you've sinned against, who, whose law that you have broken and your wickedness is so bad. But let me tell you about a God that loves you, that sent his son to die for you. That opens up the door. What we cannot do, though, is say, hey, this sin's okay. Adultery, no big deal. No, it is punishable by death. But we do see the mercy and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he does tell her, listen to this, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. And she called him Lord. I believe that she believed in him in that moment. And then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now we're going to get into some other sexual sins and punishments upon them. The man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered her father's nakedness, his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. We've been covering this a lot. Homosexuality, it is a deep sin. It is a death penalty sin in the old covenant. And even in the new covenant, it is still a sin. It's still worthy of death on the day of judgment. Romans 1, I won't read you the whole thing again. We've been going over that at times, that it's a deep-rooted sin and that God has given them over to a debased mind. And then Romans 1, at the end of that, talking about homosexuality and other sins too, it says, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. That's new covenant. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. As Christians, we still need to uphold God's law, that, that homosexuality is indeed a sin punishable by death on that day, and that they need to repent and be saved. And in the Corinthian church, it says, and such were some of you, speaking of homosexuals amongst them that repented, but they were washed by the blood of the lamb. Now, when the homosexual says, well, I have attraction to the same sex, and I, I, you can't disagree with them. They obviously do, but according to Romans 1, it's because God gave them over to a debased mind. It says, so they burn and lust for one another. So yes, they feel that way. But the blood of Jesus Christ can wash them from that wickedness. And it's our job to uphold the truth. We live in the last days. We live in the days of Lot where homosexuality was running rampant. We know that it's going to be like that in these days. That doesn't mean that we compromise and try to be like the world. The, the false church will try to be like the world. And you know what? They might be popular now. On the day of judgment, though, it's going to be bad for them. Teachers are held to a stricter judgment. For the pastors that said, well, homosexuality is not a bad sin, or they might say, well, as long as you abstain, but you can live with somebody. There's people trying to play this little line right there. It is a sin that must be called out and that people need to repent from. Verse 14. If a man marries a woman and her mother, it is wickedness. They should be burned with fire both he and they, that there may be no wickedness among you. If a man mates with an animal, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall kill the animal. If a woman approaches any animal and mates with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. If a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and sees her nakedness and sees his nakedness, it is a wicked thing. And they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his guilt. If a man lies with a woman during her sickness and uncovers her nakedness, he has exposed her flow and she has uncovered the flow of blood. Both of them shall be cut off from their people. Verse 18 is dealing with some particular sickness. We know that if a man was to lie with a woman, his wife during her menstrual cycle, it was just he was unclean for seven days. Leviticus 15, 24. And if any man lies with her at all, so that her impurity is on him, he shall be unclean seven days, and every bed on which he lies shall be unclean. So this is different. It must be some type of disease or sickness that he laid with her and he knew about. Verse 19, you should not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, nor your father's sister, for that would uncover it near of kin. They shall bear their guilt. If a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his na uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. If a man takes... His brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness, so they shall be childless. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them, that the land where I am bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out. 
Do you understand that? The land of Israel, the Canaanites were there before. And God is saying that the land is going to vomit the Canaanites out because of their wickedness. And he's telling them, he's warning them. He says, listen, you shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them that the land where I am bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out. We know they got vomited out. Now God's going to bring them back and continue to bring them back and he will rule and reign from Jerusalem. However, they experienced the vomiting of God. Back in Leviticus 18, 24, God said, do not defile yourselves with any of these any of these things. By all the nations, by all these, the nations are defiled, which I'm casting out before you. For the land is defiled. Therefore, I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it. The land vomits out its inhabitants. The land was vomiting them out. And here the Jews are. They are God's chosen people. That God chose these people to bring the Messiah in through them. God is going to rule and reign from that land of Jerusalem. However, they can still be vomited out. And that goes to New Testament believers as well. God uses this expression in the New Testament. And there's sometimes this mentality that, well, because I said a prayer, God will never vomit me out. Listen, God gave the Jews the land and he vomited them out. To whom much is given, much is required. He vomited out the people before. He vomited them out because they are wicked and rebellious and committed all types of sins. And yes, he's not done with the Jews. So all of Israel shall be saved. That doesn't mean that every Jew, but during the tribulation, the Jews will come to Jesus Christ. Now, Revelation 3, 15 tells us, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, and I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. If God says, I'm going to puke you up, that's not good. That means you're not saved. And you can read Bible commentators will say, well, that doesn't mean that. It does mean that. We can interpret vomiting out or God says, I will cut you off or fight against you with the sword of my mouth as a very bad thing, as you're not saved. He's writing to save people. The Bible is written to the believers. He's talking to a church. And it says, because you say, they had this in their own heart, I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do you not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Spiritually done, poor, blind, naked. Sometimes it's much easier, spiritually speaking, to be in a place that is hard. But it's at times where things are easy that we need to be careful. It's at times when, when we're walking in the blessings of God and things seem to be going fine that we start to stray away. That, that is a time where you really need to check your heart. When you haven't had a trial recently, just say, God, keep me on the right track. When you're in that land flowing with milk and honey, it's sometimes during those times, though, where you're low, they become rich spiritually. And I'm not saying you can't be rich physically and rich spiritually at the same time, but you must guard your heart. And it can be deceiving when things are easy to think, you know, I'm doing great. Everything's fine in this world. And by God's grace, sometimes he brings us low. You look at the Corinthian church. They were taking communion in an unworthy manner. He says, many are sick, many are weak, and many are dead because you take communion in an unworthy manner. God, God, because he loves you, will get your attention. Praise God that we have trials sometimes because it wakes us up. Praise God that he chastises us sometimes. He spanks us because the reality is is that this life is short. There's an eternity after it. And we don't want to be vomited out of the mouth of God on that day. We don't want him to say, I'm done with you. We want to be truly walking with God, even with the rapture coming up. You read in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells us to pray that we may be counted worthy to escape all these things that are going to come to pass upon the whole world and stand before the Son of God. That, That should be our prayer that God count me worthy to be out of here. Let me be one of the five wise virgins that was ready for you at your coming. You need to be watching. The Lord is coming at an hour you least expect, and we don't want to be vomited. Verse 23 tells us, and you shall not walk in the statutes of the nation, which I am casting out before you, for they commit all these things, and therefore I abhor them. The Canaanites, the people in that land, God actually abhorred them. They were Warned not to walk in those statutes. Which one of these sins is not accepted in America today that we've read about? Sexual sin, homosexuality, disobedient to parents, Molech, that's abortion, contacting mediums. If you look at this, and even though they weren't God's chosen people, the Canaanites, God still gave them the boot. The land still vomited them out. So the same thing, I believe, coming up with the tribulation period, there's a seven-year tribulation period coming that things are going to be really bad. Now, praise God that you are not under wrath, 
but that you have been appointed to salvation in Jesus Christ, and we've been over all the rapture stuff before, or you could call it the gathering together in the air. But judgment's coming upon this world. You look at these sins, and if God judged these people, and he's a just God, judgment's coming. It's a guarantee. And it is like the days of Lot, like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's like the days of Noah. You read that, you go back and study that. It is not that much different. It is upon us. It is time to be ready and walking with the Lord, knowing that God has a history of abhorring people and judging them. That doesn't mean that God didn't want them saved, but he literally says, he says, therefore, I abhor them. There's a point where God says, that's enough, where he wipes people out. And sometimes in the American Christianity, we want to add over graciousness and over kindness and no judgment. We say, well, God still, you listen, if you're still breathing, you can repent. But there is a time too, where God says, that's it. I abhor you. You're done. He did it. He's wiped out the world before. He's wiped out the world with a flood. He burnt up Sodom and Gomorrah, and the tribulation period is coming again. And I want to tell you something. The world deserves it. They do. You and I, we've deserved death too, but we found salvation in Jesus Christ. And it's not a matter of self-righteousness where you'd say, well, look at how great I am and how wicked they are. The only reason why I live better than I used to is because I'm saved. I'm born again. Because God has turned a switch in my heart. The light came on. That is the reason why we as Christians live a holy life. It's not about a self-righteousness where we proclaim, I am awesome, and look at this filthy dirtball over here. God, bring your wrath on them. No, our heart is God, bring salvation. We're praying for revival, but we're also praying, Lord, come quickly because we know what's coming. We know they deserve God's wrath. We know that God's judgment's coming, and we do plead with these people. We serve a God that sent Jonah to Nineveh to some really wicked people, and they actually repented. And I have hope in these last days, even though you have all this seeker-sensitive, nonsense apostasy going on that's fake revival, I pray that God in your mercy and in your grace, you're the God that sent Jonah to Nineveh, God send some people here to anyone who is willing to listen. God, send your ministers across this country, across this state, that will preach the truth. Revival is about repentance. Revival, listen, it's not about everyone getting together and putting aside doctrine. That is modern-day fake revival where we're going to put aside our differences so we can all get along and sing a few songs. That, that's not it. True revival is saying, I'm a sinner. I'm bad. I need forgiveness of sin. It's about people coming to God and realizing their wickedness and saying, God, I, I have been so wicked. I have been sexually immoral. It's about people saying, look, Lord, I've offered up my children to Molech. God, I, I've done so much wickedness, but... Will you forgive me? And isn't that the amazing part when someone has actually come to that point where they realize how sinful they are and they come to God and God forgives them, that, that God wipes them clean, even though they deserve the vomiting out, even though they deserve the wrath of God, even though they were in such wickedness that we serve such a merciful God that God will forgive them. Now that's amazing, but we can't forget that we need to preach sin, that we need to preach law, that they are sinners and that they have broken God's law, that they are indeed going to hell. Telling a homosexual that that's all right and that's the way you feel is not loving. That is self-love. When we don't confront people about their sin, all that is is self-love usually because we don't want to have a conflict. But if you love God, you'll stand up for the truth and pray in these last days that we will stand strong for the truth of God's word. Verse 24. But all these, but I have said to you, you shall inherit their land and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. And you shall therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean, between unclean birds and clean. You shall not make yourselves abominable by beast or by bird or by any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And you should be holy to me for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. A man or woman who, who is a medium, who has, a familiar, who has familiar spirits, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. So that last verse is dealing with someone who is a medium or has a familiar spirit. Verse 6 was a person who turns to mediums and has familiar spirits. So th this is important. And in the day and age that we live, that, that people are just spiritual. They're into spiritual stuff. And I have heard people tell me, oh, this dead person spoke to me. No, it is demonic. Yes, the Holy Spirit can speak to you. The Bible says, he who, has a hear, who, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. We need to hear the Holy Spirit speak to us, and the Holy Spirit will never contradict this word right here. 
That's how you know whether it's God speaking or not. If, it, if it's in line with this word, then it's God speaking to you. But if somebody telling you or some spirit telling you that, hey, it's okay to go commit adultery or God understands your sin, that's okay. You, keep, you know what? That's not the spirit of God. Or if someone's saying, yeah, my dead relative came. No, that is not God. That is not his spirit doing that. This is wickedness. And I brought this up last week. I didn't bring it up again. But this is a book. It's Have Heart, Bridging the Gulf Between Heaven and Earth, endorsed by Greg Laurie and Chuck Missler. These are people who are promoted within a movement I used to be part of, and they actually speak to their dead child, supposedly. And I will read you quotes from this. And again, this, this is accepted today. This isn't something that the church has rejected, unfortunately. On page 82 of Have Heart, it says, Only two weeks after Josiah went to heaven, this is a sad story, I, Sarah, made it a habit to talk to Josiah. I would then be in instant conversation with Jesus and Sia. I mean, this is bad, and people promoted this. Big name Christian leaders promote this book back in the day when it came out. Page 99. It was like he had just appeared there. This is them actually having an experience where they think Josiah showed up to them. It was like he just appeared there. It was a sense of him coming into the aisle. And he got down on one knee and bent into my ear and he said, way worth it, Mr. Jim. And then as quickly as he came, he left. It wasn't that he disappeared. Rather, it was a sense of him leaving the sanctuary. He had a sense of speed about him. Not that he was hurried, but as if life on earth was much slower than in heaven. It's a different place, a different plane. I stood up and went over to my wife and told her Josiah was just here. They, literally, they're having contact with some type of spirit. And it is not the spirit of God and it is just demonic. Page 125. You don't know father or mother. Or you, you don't father or mother a child for 19 years and then hear God say, oh, you can't talk to him. You no longer have a relationship with him until you see him face to face in heaven. We still talk to Josiah, and it's going to be a great, it's going to be so great when we're together again. And this is sin. It is heart-wrenching as it is that they lost your child. This is complete wickedness, worthy of the death penalty, not to be inside the church. And we pray for revival. That means we stand strong in the word of God. And even when people have these things that happen to them, we still stand strong and say, that's wicked. Your book's wicked. You're, you're in contact with demonic spirits. We need to stand strong in these last days. And always it stems from that relationship that you have with God through Jesus Christ. That, that is where your strength comes from. That is when you can run and not grow weary. But if you put other things first, such as human relationship, you can fall. It's not human relationship first, it's relationship with God. If you put money or work first before you walk with God, you're going to fall. It is true. You read about the four soils. Jesus talks about a certain soil that gets choked out or you know, it grows up among the thorns, and it says that the cares of this life and the deceitfulness, deceitfulness of riches chokes out the word and they become unfruitful. There are people that will start this race, but the love of money will choke out the word. When it's between Jesus or the buck, they always take the buck. And the deceitfulness is the thinking that the things here really matter in the end. I mean, think about it. What, what do you have that you work for that's really going to matter in the end? None of it really matters in the end. God might allow you to have a house, use it for his glory. He might give you a car, but remember, when you get to heaven, it's not going to be about what you drove, what you lived in, what you wore. And I'm not putting any type of guilt on someone that has stuff. God might bless you with it and praise God, but don't put that before God. Don't let what you have or your dollar bill become your God because on the day of judgment, green rectangles cannot save you. Only the blood of Jesus will save you on that day. You can't take a U.S. dollar bill with you to heaven. None of that goes. The only things that will last for eternity are one, your soul in either heaven or hell, and number two, the things that you did unto the Lord, so you can have reward. You are saved by the blood of Jesus, but then your works are tested by fire. And on that day, you can actually have reward. And talking about giving your actual green rectangles you have, you can invest them in the kingdom of God. And it tells us that he who sows sparingly, reaps sparingly. He who sows bountifully, reaps bountifully. You know, whatever you're going to sow, you're going to reap. You don't put much into the kingdom, you still might be saved, but you get there, you're not going to have as much. I don't think you'll be disappointed when you're saved. But you can also have great treasure in heaven. You can have great riches in heaven. And we need to truly pray that God, God, transform our hearts, Lord. And I say as someone that is closer to God today than I've ever been, but I also plan on being closer to God next year than I've ever been. And the year after that, closer to God than I've ever, I, I plan on continuing to grow because if not, you're just lukewarm. So in your heart, you should be closer today to God than you've ever been but your plan is to be even closer tomorrow and closer the day after and closer the day after that and that you truly have eyes fixed on eternity. 
And once you get your eyes off eternity, there's no joy. Satan's got you in this trap of thinking, yeah, if I have this, I'll be really happy. I'll, I'll tell you as a, another human being, human to human here, I've, I've gotten things before. I thought, oh, it's going to be awesome to have. After you have it a month, it's really not that great anymore. The little dopamine rush that you had when you got it wears off. I, an example of that, fidget spinners. This is small, but you have kids that go around with fidget spinners. Every kid wanted one for a month. And they would sit there and spin it and spin it. You know what? They, they have them on sale everywhere now because everyone's sick of having them. The fun wore off. And that happens with our material items. We get some, it's like an adult fidget spinner. And you're like, oh, this is so cool. And then a month later, you're like, oh, it's not that cool anymore. But see, God's so much different. Things in heaven are so much better than that. And that they never get boring. They never get old. A walk with God is always awesome. And when you get to heaven, you can have true eternal treasure true treasure forever. Now, I'm going to pray in a minute. You and God know where your hearts are at. Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you've never been born again. And if that's you, now's the time to get saved. Now is the time to pray, God, I might have known about you, but I've never known you. I've never actually had the forgiveness of sins come upon me. And that, that's that simple that you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it's, it's so simple. It's a heart conversion. And yes, works will follow, but there's a true, genuine heart conversion. If you have never, ever, ever been saved, I mean born again. And born again means like you have a complete spiritual transformation. It's not just about knowing about God or reading about. Being born again means that you're literally a new creation in Christ, and it's awesome. And I, I can tell you as someone who is born again that there is nothing like it. There is, there is nothing like knowing God. There's nothing like being redeemed from your sin, that you are on hell, and even if you want to make pretend in your mind you're not going to hell, if you're not saved, you're going to hell, and you still have that weight bearing on you. As much as you want to play a mind game and people want to do yoga and meditate, that's not going to do anything for you. They're going to hell even more then. Now, the deal is, though, when you're truly born again, it's awesome. You have your sins forgiven and wiped away is unbelievable. To have a walk with God, to actually know God is awesome. So now is going to be the time to pray for that. If you're backslidden, that you've known God, but you walked away, now's the time to pray, God, I need to come home. Because there is death away. If you read the account of the prodigal son, it says he was dead and is alive again. You, you can die, but you can come back. And if that's your heart, pray right now in a minute when we pray that, God, I need to come back. Maybe when we pray in a minute, you need to pray for revival in your own heart. That, God, I just need, I need revival. I need, not that you've completely walked away, not that you're prodigal, but... God, I, I just need a revival. You haven't been my first love. I, I really, you know what, Lord? And here's a great thing. God wants you there. He, he's, he's for you doing that. And maybe you just need to pray that, God, my walk is awesome. Lord, I want to be more awesome. Lord, I want you to cleanse me more of my wickedness. Father, I, I know I got so much more to go, Lord. Make me more holy. Make me more like you. Whatever it is, now is the time to do that. Now is the time to get right with God. So let's pray. Lord, I pray for anyone here. Father God, that is not saved, Lord, that they would become born again. Lord, your Holy Spirit would work between them and you right now, Lord, that they would confess you. Lord, I pray for any prodigals, God, that they too would come back. God, I pray for those that need revival to have revival, Father. Father, you know what the sin is, Lord. You know what is holding whatever it is that person back from you, Father God. God, I pray for anybody, Father, that just want to get, wants to get closer to you, Lord wants to know you more, wants to be refined more. Lord, may you do that awesome work. And God, I thank you for your son, Lord. I, I thank you for your word, God. This law condemned us, Lord. But Lord, I thank you for the grace found in your son, Jesus. Lord, that we may be redeemed. In Jesus' name, amen.